A very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Our text today is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. And it's very important that churches and Christians embrace the principles the Apostle Paul is urging us to embrace in this passage. Because without such unity, a local congregation can become fractured and disunited. And remember, this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in this text. He's writing to the local church of Ephesus, the local Christians. He's not talking about ecumenicalism or unity within a denomination. He's talking about the characteristics that are required for Christians in a local church to become united in order for Christ to do great things in them and through them. So let's read our text. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Whenever a Christian congregation moves into a new building, a good question to ask is, what kind of church are we going to put in this building? You do not build a church of bricks and mortar. Nowhere in the New Testament do we see that image or concept of the church. All you do when you build a building is you build a building to house the church of Jesus Christ, which is made up of people. And so the same principle is true for those who have an existing building that houses Christians. What type of church do we want to be in this building, in our community? The Apostle Paul is concerned about this very issue for the Ephesian Christians. Three essential tools in a pastor's tool bag are instruction and exposition, explaining the great biblical truths to people. And the Apostle Paul has been doing this to the Christians at Ephesus. Intercession is something we need to be engaged in as church ministers. Praying for Christians to understand these truths, praying for each other. And you will remember, if you follow the rest of this series, that the Apostle Paul has already told them of two prayers of the things that he was praying for them. And exhortation is also necessary. Where well, the Apostle Paul is now saying, now go and live a life worthy of that which Christ has called you to live. And here's how you do it. And go and do this because of what I've just said to you. So if you prefer, the Apostle Paul teaches the Ephesian Christians he prays for them, and now in this passage, he appeals to them. And so he makes a shift in his teaching to speak about the practical truths for the church. He switches from exposition to exhortation. For the three chapters prior to these, our text today, the Apostle Paul has been instructing the Ephesian Christians in some great doctrinal truths, writing about the incalculable riches there are in Jesus Christ. And then after telling them that he is praying for them, he is now appealing to them to live these truths out. He's exhorting, urging them, appealing to them. Now put it into practice. He says in verse 1, as we read, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. There's a double entendre there. Paul was a prisoner of Christ and a prisoner for Christ. He was bound to Christ by chains of love and loyalty due to his own calling. 
and he was bound by physical chains in the world because of that calling. The verb beseech, which is para kelio, is a call to exhort, to encourage, to entreat, to beg. That's what it means. What is Paul encouraging them to do? He said to walk worthy of the calling with which they were called. To walk means to go in a certain direction, taking one step at a time. Christian unity depends upon the charity of our conduct towards each other as Christians. Walking in the right direction in terms of our conduct in the church and towards others in the church, one step at a time. He's not saying how Christians are to behave in the world at this time, but how Christians are to conduct themselves towards one another. And we are called to follow Christ. And there are four character traits that the Apostle Paul lists here that are the four foundational traits of Christian unity. Notice I said traits, not truths. They're characteristics, traits we are to embrace as Christians. And the first is lowliness or humility. You can use either word. The second is meekness or gentleness. Again, you can use either word. The third is long suffering or patience. Again, you can use either word. And the fourth is forbearance or bearing. The manifest presence of Christian unity is often lost in a church congregation because the principles that produce unity, those four principles, those four characteristics, are not practiced because they do not exist in the hearts and minds of the Christians in that congregation. And again, remember, Paul is not talking about ecumenicalism here or unity in a church denomination. He's talking about the unity that is to dis be displayed in a local church. In this case, it was the church at Ephesus. So he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all loneliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. And so the first character trait there is loneliness or humility. It's from the Greek word tapirothanosomy. It's not running around like Uriah Heep from the Dickens novel, David Copperfield. It's not running around like him, pretending to be ever so humble, as he says. And in fact, he says that to David Copperfield quite often. I want to be humble! And yet he was anything but he tried to cheat him. Humility is seeing yourself as God sees you. It's having an honest estimation about ourselves. And humility is essential to unity because pride is the exaltation of self. It leads to so much disunity in churches and Humility is necessary to Christian unity, and pride destroys unity. Instinctively, we like people who give us the respect that we feel we deserve, and we instinctively dislike those who feel disrespect us and treat us like dirt. But Paul is urging them here to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, and by doing so, to embrace the characteristic of humility. Pride is focusing on receiving the respect we feel we deserve, where humility is giving other Christians respect by valuing their intrinsic God-given worth. And when we do so, we promote harmony among God's people in the church. But when we walk in pride, we provoke disunity. But walking in humility, recognising how God sees us, that we are who we are because of his love, because of his grace, having an honest evaluation of ourselves. That promotes unity in the Christian 
church. The second character trait the Apostle Paul talks about here is meekness or gentleness. Was you could use the word kindness as well, because the Greek word there is prehoetes, and that's what it means: mildness, gentleness, meekness, or kindness. Meekness is a quality of being gentle, kind, and unselfish. It's about taming the temper. It's about calming the passions. It's about managing the impulses of the human heart. Meekness brings strength under control and therefore is a fountain of blessing when Christians exercise this characteristic in the congregation of Christian believers. Meekness is never a weakness. It is about submitting one's will to a higher authority and in the Christian sense this is the authority of God which will come on to the one who is Lord over the church. Meekness is the gentleness of the strong, those who strength and power, the power and strength of their personalities, their characteristics, their emotions, are under control and under submission to the Holy Spirit of God. And that's why you can also see these traits as fruits of the Spirit, which Paul wrote about in Galatians. But remember, Jesus described himself as gentle and lowly, of heart. Yet look how strong he was. He confronted evil, hypocrisy and sin and he was able to go to the cross and suffer an unjust death because he embodied the characteristic here that the Apostle Paul is urging Christians to embrace. You see, meekness and gentleness, it does not take revenge. It is not offended easily. And my goodness, how easily church congregations are divided when proud people, those full of pride and full of their own self-importance, they take offence often over things which are so very trivial, or they take offence where none was meant, or they take offence because they are too proud in themselves to actually humble themselves and listen to the viewpoints of another. Such people cannot tame their temper or their tongue. They act on emotion and impulse rather than the disciplined qualities of being the weak man or woman that the Apostle Paul is encouraging us to be here. The third character trait is long-suffering or patience and it basically means long-tempered. That would be a literal translation of this word, which the Greek word is macroothumia, and that's what it means. It means basically to be patient with people. There's another word, hypomone, which means to be patient with situations and trials, but that's not what the Apostle Paul it's right in here, that's not the word he uses. The word he uses here, it means to be patient and long-tempered with other Christians in the church. Being long-tempered is the opposite of being short-tempered. And my goodness, in our impatient, self-centered world, the character trait of long-suffering or being long-tempered has all but disappeared. And it's so tragic when you just find short-tempered people in the church just getting offended with each other and falling out, without, falling out with each other. What a tragedy that is. You cannot keep the unity of the spirit when you have such people who refuse to embrace this characteristic of being long-suffering or long-tempered. After all, Christ, is long-suffering and patient with us. God himself is long-suffering and patient with us. As in everything else, Jesus Christ himself set the standard for which we can follow as Christians. And many of God's servants develop the quality of, being, of becoming long-suffering through their service and their dedication to him. 
And by doing this in unity, a church rids itself of, or at least dramatically reduces, friction. Well, actually, when Christians aren't short-tempered with others. So remember, be long suffering or embracing the characteristic of long suffering is the opposite of being short tempered. It's being patient with all people, even difficult people. But the difficult people, if they call themselves Christians, they can't just expect others to be patient with them. They have to embrace and live by this quality as well because the Apostle Paul is writing to all the Christians at Ephesus, not just to some of them. Jesus made a whip out of cords and forced all of them, it says in John's Gospel, both the sheep and the cattle to, cattle to leave the temple. He turned over the tables and scattered the money of those who were exchanging it. You see, when Jesus went into the temple and he saw all of the bad practices there, he didn't lose his temper. He didn't have an emotional outburst. It takes time to make a whip of cords. He took the time to weave this whip together and then went back in and acted upon the truth that God wanted to express in that particular situation. But the fourth character trait of maintaining unity is bearing with one another. The original word is anakomahai. It means to hold up or to bear with. It means to make allowances for each other's faults. And of course, these four characteristic personality traits, they are bound together by love. And love seeks the welfare and good of the Christian community and does not insist on its own way. You see, that is when we can have a visible unity in a local congregation as Christians, when we practice these traits, when people of different backgrounds, temperaments, personalities, and so on, can actually learn how to live together as Christians. And so Paul is writing about the standards that are required by every group of people who call themselves a church and who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. And it's a great vision. Because remember, he wrote to the church of the Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So there was a diversity of people, but they can all become united in Christ when they embrace these characteristics that the Apostle Paul is urging and beseeching them to live by in the local congregation to make every effort so it requires effort from our part and Christ can change us and so that we can imbibe them but it's important we understand what the Lord is saying to us through the apostle and how to maintain unity in the local congregation because we are called to keep the unity of the spirit by making every effort to keep the bond of peace and to walk in that right direction step by step day by day and seeking to keep that unity. And what is that unity he's talking about? As though it already exists. Well, it does. Because there is one Holy Spirit, as he says in the text. If you are truly born again, then you are God's offspring. You are living in a new dimension of experience and you have the treasure that Jesus called eternal life. And you have it because the Holy Spirit has opened up the truths to you about who Jesus is. And he brought you into the one true body of Jesus Christ. And the same Holy Spirit that guides and inspires and teaches and helps you is the same Holy Spirit who does fight so for God's other children. The Holy Spirit who inspires others in the church is the same Holy Spirit inspiring you. There is one Holy Spirit in the earth. And he's inspiring Christians worldwide in who knows how many millions of congregations there are across the world. But remember, it's the same Holy Spirit in the same congregation who has brought other people to Christ in the same way that he has brought you to Christ. And that's why Paul says there is one Lord. When you become a Christian 
or when you became a Christian, you came to the same Lord and Saviour as the other people in your church did. You came to the same Lord and Saviour I came to. Jesus Christ, he is the one who saved others in your fellowship and he is the one who saved you and brought you into fellowship with them. Jesus the same yesterday, today and forever. The one Lord Jesus Christ, he's their Lord, he's your Lord. And isn't it wonderful when all of those who do call upon him as Lord embrace the characteristics that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. You may have come to the Lord Jesus Christ at a different time, at a different place, but you came to exactly the same Jesus as others in your fellowship came to. And if you believe in that one person, Jesus as Lord and Saviour, then you are part of one faith in him. You are baptised into Jesus by water and spirit into that faith. So there is also one baptism that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. And over all, as he says in the text, is the Heavenly Father. There's one Abba, one Father, because there's one Christian family. And every Christian you meet and every Christian in your local congregation is your brother and sister in Christ. For we all share the one hope of which the Apostle Paul talks about here. We share the same hope in Christ. Remember the Apostle Paul had already talked about the wonderful calling and hope we have in Christ in the previous chapters which we've already looked at in past weeks. And so in verse 6, Paul is describing God when he says, One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. He's talking about God's power over all. His omnipotence, which means his power. His omniscience, which means his all-knowing. And his omnipresence, which means God can be present among all his people in all places at the same time. There's no part of the creation where God is not present. Yet there's places where his presence is manifested and that should be in the congregation of Christians. And Christians cannot see the Shekinah glory of God or experience the blessings and workings of God mightily in them unless they have the unity which the Apostle Paul is talking about here. God does not bless disunity. He only blesses unity. Unity in a congregation does not mean it's a lifeless, colourless conformity. It just means that there is one body, one Holy Spirit, one hope, one Lord Christ, one faith, one baptism and one Father. And we'll look at this next time, but in verse 7 it says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. As a Christ's gift bestows those different gifts on his body, his family. Saving grace is the grace that saves sinners and is given to all who believe. But grace to serve is given to different Christians. And is given in different degrees to different people to equip them to serve God in different ways. And unity in the diversity of who we are as a people, now united under Christ, and diversity within that unity in our calling to serve is what we will look at next time. So God bless you. Amen. Oh Lord, my true word, 
Would you like to say together with me the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be among you now and for always. And may you embrace those wonderful characteristics that we've looked at today, that enable a local congregation of Christian believers with a diversity of the types of people who is among them. But by embracing these characteristics, they can keep the unity of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you as you make your efforts to do so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. God bless you with that unity. But you're the ones who've got to put it into practice. You're the ones who've got to make the effort to do it. You are the ones who have to work hard to make sure that you are not the one who is splitting your church, but that God is using you to unite people together in his name so great things can be done. Amen, amen, and amen. <laughs>